Edinburgh at 10, but you can keep up with all the latest developments on the BBC website. Now, though, time to join all our colleagues for the news where you are. Bye for now. Tonight on Reporting Scotland, Hamza Yusuf resigns as First Minister and leader of the SNP. Facing two no-confidence votes, he says he underestimated the level of hurt caused by ending a power-sharing deal with the Scottish Greens. While a route through this week's motion of no confidence was absolutely possible, I am not willing to trade my values and principles or do deals with whomever simply for retaining power. Hamza Yusuf says he'll remain as First Minister until his successor is elected. But who could that be? Tonight, two names are in the frame. The former First Minister, John Swinney, and the former Finance Secretary, Kate Forbes. We've also been out across the country hearing your views on today's dramatic events. Sorry to see him uh, resign. Uh, I thought he had a lot still in him to give. I don't think he was the man for the job, to be honest. Full of promises which never transpired, but then that comes with quite a lot of the, the ministers that take office. It's probably a good thing to be honest, and better for the Green Party, but I don't know. It's yeah, I don't know. <laughs> politics today is just madness. Hello, I'm Laura Miller. Welcome to Monday's specially extended edition of Reporting Scotland, live from the Scottish Parliament in Edinburgh. Welcome to Holyrood on what has been a dramatic day in Scottish politics. After a weekend of fevered speculation, just after noon today, Hamza Youssef confirmed to a room of journalists, advisers and family that he would be standing down as First Minister. He said he'd clearly underestimated the hurt he'd caused in ending the power-sharing agreement with the Greens last week and that repairing the relationship across the political divide could only be done with someone else at the helm. His decision comes just over a year since he took office and it now leaves the SNP looking for a new leader again and the country a new First Minister. Over this specially extended edition of Reporting Scotland, we'll be asking who and what comes next for Scotland. But first, with the story of the day, here's our political correspondent, Lindsay Bewes. Mr Yousaf, are you resigning today? Questions about Hamza Yusuf's future had been mounting for days. This morning, he left his home in Dundee to announce his resignation. The media gathered at his official residence in Edinburgh, where he admitted the way he ended his power-sharing deal with the Greens had been a fatal mistake. My hope was to continue working with the Greens in a less formal arrangement as the SNP moved into a new phase of minority government. Unfortunately, in ending the Butte House Agreement in the manner that I did, I clearly underestimated the level of hurt and upset that caused Green colleagues. For a minority government to be able to govern effectively and efficiently, trust when working with the opposition is clearly fundamental. And while a route through this week's motion of no confidence was absolutely possible, I am not willing to trade my values and principles or do deals with whomever simply for retaining power. Facing defeat in a confidence vote later this week, Mr Yousaf opted to jump before being pushed. I've concluded that repairing our relationship across the political divide can only be done with someone else at the helm. I have therefore informed the SNP's National Secretary of my intention to stand down as party leader and ask that she commences a leadership contest for my replacement as soon as possible. The personal impact of the end of his premiership was clear. I am in absolute debt to my wonderful wife, my beautiful children and my wider family for putting up with me over the years. I'm afraid you will be seeing a lot more of me uh, from now. You are truly everything to me. And although, of course, uh, as you can tell, I'm sad that my time as First Minister is ending, but I am so grateful, I'm so blessed 
for having the opportunity that are afforded to so few. And with that, Mr Yusuf's time at the top is coming to a close. It was an emotionally charged resignation from Hamza Yusuf, accused of a breach of trust and poor political judgment. His successor will now face the challenge of building enough support in Holyrood to govern. The problems began for Hamza Youssef when he sacked his junior partners in government, opting to end their deal before Green members voted on its future. Relations had strained over watered-down climate targets and the response to a review of gender identity services for children, while some within the SNP harboured longer-term concerns over Green influence in government on issues such as trans rights. Angered by their dismissal, the Greens refused to back Mr Youssef in a confidence vote. Their support now depends on the direction of the new First Minister. It is entirely up to the SNP to decide who they want to lead their party. It's for them to decide what kind of party they want to be. Do they want to continue to be a progressive party? Do they continue to want to make income tax fairer? Do they continue to want to work for the climate and nature emergencies? Or do they want to take a different direction? And that is up to them to decide. Mr Yusuf's last hope of staying in power was the Alaba MSP, Ash Regan. Her party boss claiming talks took place in an early morning phone call. The reason he didn't do a deal with Alaba is there were forces within his own party who stopped him doing it. Let's call them the old guard. With senior SNP figures describing a deal with Mr Salmond as impossible, the government said the call was simply a courtesy. Opposition parties say the First Minister's resignation is not enough. It's a mess of the SNP own making, of Hamza Youssef's own making. He took the decision to end the Butte House Agreement. I told him not to go back into it. You know, I urged the SNP when Nicola Sturgeon resigned that they should give up the Greens uh, in that coalition government. They have been bad for Scotland. And I think it would be completely unacceptable, untenable actually, for the SNP to just impose another unelected leader on this country. That's why we believe we should have an election. I think this will be another First Minister without a popular mandate. We need to go back to the country, the people that sent us to this place and ask them for new instructions. Amid the criticism, there was some sympathy. Posting on social media, Nicola Sturgeon says she knows what a wrench it is to step aside. Adding Hamza Youssef has conducted himself with grace, dignity and integrity. It's farewell from Scotland's sixth First Minister after little over a year in office. His party now seeking a replacement much sooner than they'd expected. Lindsay Bewes, Reporting Scotland, Holyrood. Well, we are going to be unpacking lots of strands of this huge story tonight. But first of all, let's bring in someone who is at the very heart of the government Tamsa Yusuf is standing down from, his Deputy First Minister, Shona Robeson. Um, thank you very much for joining us this evening. You were in that room when Hamza Yusuf gave that speech today. What was that like for you? Well, it was very powerful, uh, emotional. Uh, I think he uh, did it with great dignity in a, a, ve a very difficult day for, for him um, and his family. Uh, and I, I think it's the mark of the man that, that he did that. He reflected a lot on the events leading up to this, but also his experiences as First Minister and the honour that it's been for him to serve. And also you know, some reflections on where he thought things should go next. Nevertheless, he, he's brought this on himself, hasn't he? This has been a huge miscalculation on his, on his part in ending that Butte House agreement with the Greens, has it not? So, first of all, I think everybody realised that the Butte House agreement was coming to an end one way or another, and I think it was therefore about how it was done, and that's I think, where the miscalculation uh, happened uh, in the way it was done and you know the mark of the man again is that he has completely owned that and he has said it was a miscalculation a misjudgment and recognizes the hurt that that caused and he's paid the ultimate price for that uh, today with his resignation so was the right decision just bad handling of it well i think all of us could see that one way or another it was going to come to an end um i think the parties, the Green Party and indeed the SNP were having a number of discussions about whether or not uh, internally, uh, whether that it should continue or not. I think it was the, the, the right decision to bring it to an end, but the way it was done, I think, 
Hamza Yusuf has accepted himself that that was not the best way. OK, let's turn to what comes next. Who comes next? First of all, are you running? Definitely not. Um, okay. I am getting on with the job of Deputy First Minister and, of course, Finance Secretary. There's a lot of work to be done over the next uh, few weeks, so definitely not. OK, good, clear answer then. Who are you backing then? Well, I'm not going to back anyone uh, for the reason that I don't think I, I should. I think we should let the party decide. Uh, I'll have my own views, but I think it has to be someone who, first of all, can unite the party, uh, take forward the priorities, but also, and this is the tricky bit, reach across the parliament. The parliament is a parliament of minorities. The SNP, of course, has been in minority government more than any other form of government, but the, the parliament is a bit of a fractious place at the moment and I think someone who can reach out and uh, try to perhaps reset some of that relationship. That's a two-way street though. It would require the opposition parties to also respond to that way. Could that, that uniting force then be John Swinney? He is one of the names that says he is actively considering the position as is Kate Forbes. Well look, as I say, I'm not going to uh, endorse uh, anyone. What I would say is, uh, well I've worked for many years with, with John. He um, is very experienced, has a lot of uh, skills and talents, but ultimately this will be for the party to decide that who at this point they believe uh, would be the best uh, leader of the party and of course our candidate to become First Minister should Parliament approve that. In some ways um, it, it doesn't matter in the sense that um, whoever is coming into the job and you face the same political arithmetic, they're still going to have to do a deal with the Greens, for instance. Will that work? Well, I think it will be a different set of relationships. So there are many uh, issues, of course, where we would continue to, to work with Greens on a day-to-day -day basis around you know, the, the climate and many other policies. But I think there are many other uh, areas that you know, there is some consensus across the parliament and um, we need to try and bring some of that out. So a good example that's coming up, of course, is the legislation around the post office to get uh, justice for our sub postmasters and sub postmistresses. So there are issues where we can uh, unite as a parliament and uh, speak with one voice. And I think the public actually quite like that. Just briefly, if you can, how harmful do you think this instability is for your party heading into a general election year? Well, look, um, we need to get our act together, clearly, uh, and as quickly as possible, and uh, making sure that we can hit the, the ground running in that general election uh, period is going to be very important because we have a really important prospectus to, to set out about what we think is best for Scotland in terms of its journey forward, and we are uniquely placed to be able to put that case uh, for or, of what is best for Scotland. So we need to get our, our act together, we need to get out there, and I'm sure we will be able to hit the ground running uh, by the general election. Well, Shona Robison, Deputy First Minister, uh, on a busy day for you and a cold day at Holyrood. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you. Well, Hamza Youssef has been in office for exactly 13 months. He was seen as the continuity candidate when he was elected last March to succeed Nicola Sturgeon as SNP leader. Our political correspondent, Kristen Campbell, looks at the events that have shaped him and his leadership. Hamza Yusuf made history when he became Scotland's youngest First Minister and the first Scots Asian to hold the role. But he's had a turbulent time in office. He'd only been in post a few days when police searched the home of his predecessor Nicola Sturgeon as part of their inquiry into the SNP's finances. He's had to ditch controversial policies like the bottle deposit return scheme and he's lost a court battle with the UK government over gender recognition reform. Hamza Yusuf's supporters say he's shown great resilience in carrying on for so long in the face of so many challenges. His critics say he simply wasn't up to the job. During the leadership election, even his colleagues questioned his record in government. When you were transport minister, the trains were never on time. When you were justice minister, the police were strained to breaking point. And now as health Minister, we've got record high waiting times. He was victorious then, but he's been on the back foot ever since. As the continuity candidate, what he essentially has done is continue with the same failures that his predecessor had in not really getting to grips with the state of the economy in Scotland, with the health service, with the drug deaths, with the housing crisis. He didn't have his own agenda, he didn't have his own vision, and he didn't seem to want to change tack. And that was a major problem for him. 
It was the Iraq war that inspired Hamza Youssef to join the SNP as a student. He'd concluded that only independence would stop Scotland being dragged into an illegal conflict. And during the current conflict in Gaza, he's won praise for highlighting the suffering of the Palestinian people and for showing solidarity with the Jewish community. His friends say he retains a passion to help those in need, here assisting Syrian refugees ashore in Greece when he was International Development Minister. A career politician who's had his ups and downs, his decision to sack the Greens looks like a misjudgment that's cost him dear. He seemed to be a conciliator, a mediator, a different kind of leader to Nicola Sturgeon. And I think that's an extra reason that this is a really disappointing end because first on the council tax, when that was suddenly plucked out of a hat without consultation, and now with the sudden agreement at the end of the Butte House Agreement, those have been non-mediated, not really very conciliatory, look, I'm pretty tough, really, stances. And I have to say, I wonder who's been advising him. Hamza Youssef represented the country at the King's coronation. Now he will submit his resignation to the monarch. Goodbye, First Minister. Goodbye, First Minister. Goodbye. His career as First Minister over, Hamza Youssef will follow in the path of many politicians before him and spend more time with his growing family. Kirsten Campbell, Reporting Scotland, Holyrood. Well, joining me now is James Cook, the BBC's Scotland editor, who was in the room when Hamza Youssef resigned today. Um, James, it feels like the writing was on the wall over the weekend, but in the end it did unravel pretty quickly for Hamza Youssef. It unravelled so quickly since he ditched the Greens, but also really since he took office. I mean, he's barely a year in office and, and here we are. And I had, talking of being in the room, Laura, uh, just a real sense of the emotion for the man throughout this, a sense of the pride of being in his position in this office with his background and what that meant to him, how difficult it had been to him, but also a sense of the, the wounded pride and also, I think, frustration. Because in points in that statement, Laura, it felt like he was kicking himself. You could see him thinking, how did I let it come to this? And so I think there was a lot of human emotion there, but obviously there's a lot of politics going on as well. Yeah, indeed. And as you say, not so long ago that we were here when in this very spot as he took office. Um, so we look now to the future. They are looking for a new leader, a new first minister, the SNP, but in many ways it's just the same challenges. Yep, the challenges remain. Well, they have, in addition, I suppose, the challenge of minority government. That was a challenge for the last few days for Hamza Youssef. He's demonstrated how difficult that can be. Uh, but also the challenges in wider society. Goodness knows, people know what the challenges are. People talk about cost of living, they talk about the health service, they talk about housing, they talk about education. There's so much for, for the new leader to get to grips with and to get to grips with quickly. So to those people, you know, John Swinney, does he actually want it at his stage? He talked about his responsibility to his family. And for Kate Forbes, does she want it now? Or might she want to wait and see what happens at the general election when, if the polls at the moment are to be believed, the SNP will get a bit of a kicking there too? OK, uh, James Cook, BBC Scotland editor, thank you for your thoughts this evening. Well, as James was saying, attention now turns to who will replace Hamza Youssef. Here's our political correspondent, David Wallace Lockhart, with his take on the runners and riders to be the next First Minister. Hamza Youssef said today that politics is a brutal business. And he's not wrong, because after you announce you're going, attention swiftly turns to who comes next. Could history repeat itself for the SNP? John Swinney led them in opposition in the early 2000s, and some big names are encouraging him to step up to the plate again. He's considered an experienced, safe pair of hands in the party, and he's thinking about it. I'm giving very careful consideration to standing to be the leader of the SNP. I've been somewhat overwhelmed by the requests that have been made of me to do that, uh, with many, many messages from many colleagues across the party. So I'm giving that issue very active consideration and it's likely I'll have more to say about that in the days to come. 
So, is it Mr Swinney's for the taking? Not necessarily. Another obvious name is Kate Forbes. She narrowly lost to Hamza Youssef in the last SNP leadership contest. She's seen as being on the more socially conservative wing of the party and has warned recently that she thinks the SNP has been forgetting rural Scotland. Fergus Ewing, a former cabinet secretary, says John Swinney is continuity. He thinks Kate Forbes will run as a fresh start. Hamza was very dignified today. I take my hat off to him but it just hasn't gone well. And when things go badly, it's time for a change. And the time for Kate has now come. So who's not running? Well, Stephen Flynn is the party's Westminster leader, and he's a big name in the SNP. Technically, he can be party leader from Westminster, but he's ruled himself out. He's backing John Swinney, as are some other senior cabinet voices. We still don't have any declared candidates yet, but someone from the SNP benches will have to take on the job of First Minister. Will we get a coronation or will we get a competition? Well, David joins us now. David, lots of questions there. Those were the runners and riders. Um, but what is going on in the background at the moment? So, I mean, if we do end up with a competition, Laura, between John Swinney and Kate Forbes, it perhaps doesn't feel that different to the competition we had last time around. If you look at the camps that seem to be forming already, they do seem quite similar. I think with John Swinney, you've, you've got someone with experience, perhaps something of an elder statesman of the SNP. But there are those who are saying that radical change is what's needed for the party now, and perhaps the person who served as Nicola Sturgeon's deputy for so long doesn't represent a, a break with the past and is open to that accusation of being the continuity candidate. When it comes to Kate Forbes, she's someone also with quite a bit of cabinet experience. I think if she does run, we can hear her talking about things she spent the last 12 months or so talking about wanting the SNP to move away from some social issues, wanting taxes in Scotland to be lower, wanting a focus on rural Scotland as well. Now, it's important to say no declared candidates yet, but if there is a leadership contest between these two, the last leadership contest did get a bit ill-tempered at points. Perhaps this one would be a bit more mild-mannered, though it will, will still expose divisions within the party. OK, David Wallace-Lockhart, thank you very much for your thoughts. OK, well, let's turn to our political correspondent, Kristen Campbell, now, who can answer some of the big questions around exactly what happens next. Thanks uh, for joining us, Kristen. Um, we heard there about whose name is in the frame, um, but you're somebody that knows parliamentary process unlike any other. What are we going to see over the next coming weeks and months? Well, the SNP is still to decide on a timetable for the election of a new leader. There's clearly a hope in some quarters that there won't need to be a contest, while others are warning against a coronation. Whatever they do, they'll want to do it quickly, because at the moment, Hamza Youssef is just keeping the seat warm for the next occupant. And he still faces to no confidence votes. Those votes will still go ahead. Uh, the Conservatives and the Labour Party think it's important that MSPs get to give their verdict on his time in power. I expect the votes to happen on Wednesday afternoon and MSPs are likely to be asked to vote on Labour's motion of no confidence on the government's future first. Now, his decision to stand down has lanced that festering boil of the Greens' anger. So they're no longer going to back those motions, which in effect makes them redundant. There's perhaps some kind of confusion over this part of the process, but um, when, when do they have to pick a new leader by the well, SNP? Yeah, they... there's a lot of talk about a 28-day yeah. deadline. Now, that is a legal requirement. Parliament cannot be without a First Minister for more than a month or you would need to have an election. But that clock has not yet started ticking and it doesn't do so until Hamza Youssef tenders his resignation to the king. So only when he does that does that clock start ticking. So in effect what he's done today is bought him a bit more time. We'd expect him to stay in post until the SNP elects his successor but then Parliament must approve that appointment. Well Kirsten Campbell thank you very much as ever for bringing clarity on that. Thank you. Well, we've heard from the politicians and the journalists, but what do the voters think of today's news? Katrina Renton has been finding out. For the last year, Hamza Youssef has been First Minister, but he's represented the Glasgow Pollock constituency since 2016. 
At lunchtime, as he announced his resignation, we asked local constituents their views about his time in office. What do you think about, um, about Hamza Youssef resigning as First Minister? I, I don't really think that he should do that because he's done a lot for uh, Scotland. He's doing the best for Scotland, so he should reconsider. I don't think he was a man for the job, to be honest. Full of promises which never transpired, but then that comes with quite a lot of the, the ministers that take office. So We vote SNP, but I don't think he's been a very good First Minister anyway, besides what's been in local, so he's done nothing for us. Absolutely nothing. He's done no bad. He's done no bad, but the biggest majority of people are wanting him out anyhow. That's a certainty, you know what I mean? But I'm sorry to see him uh, resign. Uh, I thought he had a lot still in him to give uh, in his time in office. I've met him in the Hustons and he came across, he's been really good. He knew, he knew his brief. <laughs> it's probably a good thing, to be honest, and better for the Green Party, but... I don't know. It's yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Politics today is just madness. Closer to Hamza Yousaf's family home in Dundee, voters there had a similar mix of opinions. He's had a very, very hard time since he came into the into the job, um, and I think it's made it very difficult now for the SNP. Full stop. Well, I wasn't really all that surprised. I think the wheels have been coming off for a while, so I think it's probably it's time to go, but I don't know about the chaos that ensues who's going to take over. So. Sad to see Hamza go, but there'll be somebody else in the background that's coming up. Now, whether it's going to be um, someone from Westminster or whether it's going to be someone from within the party or someone that's unknown yet, I'm sure that we'll, they'll get back on track fairly soon. In the islands of Orkney and Shetland, people reflected on the news. Surprising, um, and I'm, I hope whoever replaces him uh, can do uh, just as good or if not a better job than he did um, at the helm and running the country. I think it's the best thing that could ever happen. I think he had no, no regard for Orkney and Shetland at all. He just wasn't the right person for the job. He's basically taken Scotland from up here to down here. I thought he was actually fairly competent. Um, never been a fan of the SNP, mind you. Um, but um, uh, I don't know quite who will take over um, and it will make a difference, I suppose, to what happens in Scotland. In the Highlands near Inverness, thoughts were turning to what happens next. Some want to have their say and go to the polls. Obviously election, because he was never brought in. There's not, they're going, the next new one has never been voted in, so as should be, yeah. I think it's time to sort of see what the population think of the last few years where we've had misgovernment, mishandling of just about everything under the sun, roads, transport, Money. ferries. I think uh, an election. I think an election. There's been too much, on Westminster as well as here, too much shuffling around. Personally, for him, it's quite a sad event, but it couldn't have gone on the way it was going with indecision all over the place. It's not satisfactory. Well, with days like this of big political drama, there's always lots going on behind the scenes, as you would expect. Hopefully we can get some insight into that now with Stuart Nicholson. Up until last year, when Nicholas Sturgeon resigned, he had been head of communications and advisor to the First Minister for 10 years. Thanks for your time tonight, Stuart. Um, did it surprise you in the end how quickly this unravelled for Hamza Youssef? It did surprise me because I think, and it surprised most people, I think, last week how quickly events unravelled uh, on the day when Hamza Youssef announced the end of the Butte House Agreement, the pact with the Greens. Uh, by the time uh, tea time came round that, that same day, it was looking pretty grim for, for Hamza. Uh, not, quite, not quite checkmate, but getting there, and things obviously hadn't improved uh, in, the, in the, the ensuing days over the weekend. Clearly, they would have been looking for a way out of this, trying to find, trying to game a way through, but there, there was nowhere to turn in the end. Well, well is that right? Was, was this his only option? Would you indeed have advised him that this was his only option? I think it was looking that way in the end. Uh, I mean, if, if, if the only options are, are, are you know, really bad options, then you, you choose the, 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 you know, the least worst one. And in this case, it's not, it's not a great option, but the, the, the ability to, to resign on, you know, not quite on his own terms, but to choose the moment 
rather than facing a, a vote that he looked like losing, which with all the you know the, the, the theatre that that brings. Uh, so I, I think it was increasingly getting to the point where his only option was to, to do this at the time of his choosing or to go through with a vote which he may well have lost. Just give us an insight on um, what happens then on days like this beh behind the scenes because the party still has to function, the government still has to function, but it is facing a period of uncertainty. Yeah, I mean it's very it's very difficult to, to, to get through days like this and you know I have I you know I feel for all of those involved, uh, you know, former colleagues who've been involved in this. Uh, it's 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 very difficult because you've you've got to put a, a brave face on things. Uh, despite everything that's swirling around you, the business of government has to go on and that, that, that does go on uh, behind the scenes. But it, it's extremely difficult in days like today and I, and I think what we, what we saw earlier on was, as, as I say, it was, it was maybe the least worst uh, option in terms of, of you know, having, having explored the avenues over the weekend, clearly coming to the conclusion that there was no way out of this uh, other, than, other than the path that was chosen. Do you think the new First Minister, whoever that may be, will be able to unite the party, uh, unite the government uh, and, and get the job done and work with the Parliament or are things simply too polarised? I think things are very polarised but I, I do think it should be remembered that the, the SNP is still far and away the biggest party with uh, I think 63 seats at the moment out of 129. That's, you know, it's very, very close to an outright majority. So the, the, there should be, you know, ample scope to, to, to get things done on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, otherwise, you're, you're you know, for, for the opposition, all of the opposition to unite and defeat the SNP on every single issue would require Green MSPs to, to team up with, you know, the Conservative MPs and the right wing of the Conservative Party. That's realistically that's not going to happen in every issue so there will be a way of getting things things through because the SNP are far and away the biggest party having said that to come back to the point things are very polarized and what you have here is an electoral system that's designed to create consensus and coalitions coming head to head with very polarized politics um, I'm interested to hear, get your thoughts on when the next um, Holyrood elections will be will it be as as is meant to be in 2025 or will it be um we'll be heading for something before then because of course there are two confidence votes coming up aren't there yeah i mean i, I think if, if the last week has taught us anything it's not to predict anything uh, with with too much certainty uh, if i had to you know, if i had to to guess if i had to predict i i think that the chances of an early Holyrood election while they shouldn't be ruled out i, I don't think it's it's strongly on the cards uh, Patrick Harvey, I think, and the, the, the Greens have made clear that they, while they were going to back the motion of no confidence against Hamza Youssef, they weren't in the business of backing a motion to bring down the government as a whole, which would have caused an election. So, uh, while, as I say, it's not impossible that we could be heading for an early election, depending on how things pan out, I think it's still m more likely that the, the election will be when it's scheduled. In this crucial year, a big, obviously, general election year um, for, for all parties, but for the SNP, how um, crucial is it that they now get on the front foot? Yeah, well, it, it, it is obviously crucial that they get on the front foot uh, with the new leader, whoever, whoever that may be, when they, when they take over. Uh, you know, the, the polls have been a bit fluctuated a bit, a bit volatile for the SNP, uh, and they're facing a, a Westminster context, uh, contest where they can't be the government and for many people the priority in the, that Westminster election will be changing the, the government of Westminster. That's a, that's a real challenge for the SNP in terms of Labour's position in Scotland. But I think longer term, uh, the, the SNP are still, they've got a huge base of support to, to, to call on, not least because support for independence is still very strong, it's roughly 50-50. It doesn't seem to have gone down at all and that's, you know, that's, a, that's a very solid base for the SNP to draw on. Just finally, I'm interested to get your thoughts. Um, there was a day, perhaps now two years ago, um, when there was such discipline within the SNP, within the party. Did you ever imagine getting to this point um, in the fact that we will be looking for a third first minister in what, about two years? Uh, no, uh, I don't think anybody did. Uh, but, you know, that's the, that, that's the nature of politics. It comes along with... Uh, events which, and you know, things get blown off track, blown off course, events which nobody expects. So, so no, I don't think anybody predicted this, but I think the priority now for the SNP is to, to get a new leader in place as soon as possible and to unite behind that leader. OK, Stuart Nicholson, um, thank you very much for your thoughts and for your time this evening. Um, well, 
I believe we now have to, uh, we will turn our thoughts to speaking to the BBC's political editor, Chris Mason, who is just off camera here. I think he can step in now. Um, Chris, um, we'll wait till you get mic'd up. We were going to be speaking to David Porter down at Westminster, uh, but we have a slight technical problem speaking to him. Um, but we will um, speak to Chris once he is fully mic'd up. It has been a, a pretty busy day as uh, uh, evidenced here. <laughs> um, interested to get your thoughts. I imagine when you woke up this morning, you didn't expect that you would be up here at Holyrood. I didn't. Or did you? No, I didn't. <laughs> so I woke up at 20 past six this morning and laboured under the naive misapprehension for at least an hour or so that I was heading to Milton Keynes in Buckinghamshire to do a piece about the English local elections. How naive I was. My phone suddenly lit up with various WhatsApps. I was on the phone to various people. And it was pretty clear pretty quickly that things were moving quickly here and that the First Minister was going to be saying something and saying something quite profound. I managed to arrive at Butte House with about 10 minutes to go. And you know what? To be there this lunchtime, let's just park the politics for just a second. The human fallibility, that's the thing that struck me sitting there today, listening to him, his wife just a couple of metres away, sitting one chair in front of me, in fact. And you heard him out loud, out loud Hunza Yusuf, reflecting on how different things might have been. If he had not decided to so unceremoniously and publicly dump the Greens out of government, leading to, if you like, the equal and opposite response from them, which was to haul him out of government too, how different things might have been. Politically, that have been awkward because it looked like the Butte House Agreement was going to come to an end one way or another. But could there have been an outcome that would have been different? And the implication from what he was saying at lunchtime was maybe there could. What's your sense of where this now leaves the party, of where this now leaves the Scottish Government, and also how this plays out in the wider UK politics? Well, the SNP have been so dominant for so long, haven't they? In government since 2007 here, an absolute colossus as far as the Westminster stage in Scotland is concerned, and therefore that has mattered in the whole dynamics of Westminster politics. We've seen since 2019 the Labour Party trying to haul itself off the canvas, trying to make itself competitive again. That was always going to be incredibly difficult if they couldn't find a path back to some sort of political relevance on the Westminster stage in Scotland. Now recently, in the last year or so, they felt more confident. Keir Starmer, a very regular visitor to Scotland, that hope from the Labour Party's perspective that they would be competitive again, particularly in the central belt. And they've felt that confidence for a while. You can see their smiles today because they see turbulence in their principal Scottish rival and hope from their perspective that they can capitalise on it. And that's going to matter if they can do it come the general election because if they can seize seats that have for the last best part of a decade been held by the SNP, that makes Keir Starmer's path to Downing Street that bit more straightforward. It isn't remotely straightforward, but makes it that little bit easier. OK, Chris Mason, uh, BBC's political editor, thank you very much for your time. I think you might be seeing a bit longer at Holyrood. A few more days yet. Thank you. Well, as we have mentioned, this is an election year. Rishi Sunak has previously indicated a general election will be held in the second half of the year, although that date hasn't been set. Well, our Westminster correspondent, David Porter, joins us now from London. Um, David, what have you been hearing from SNP MPs today? Laura, a great deal of interest uh, about what has been happening up with you in Holyrood at Westminster today. We have to remind ourselves that this particular drama only began last Thursday when many SNP MPs, indeed many Scottish MPs, were not there. Now here at Westminster, MPs have a uh, pretty good experience of the governing party changing its leaders. We've had three Conservative Prime Ministers in the last three years uh, without uh, a general election. You in Holyrood will now be having your third uh, First Minister in little over 18 months. Here at Westminster today, MPs for the first time have really been plugging themselves into what has been happening here. The biggest smiles on the faces of Labour MPs who believe that any instability in Scotland can only help them win a tranche of seats in Scotland and perhaps clear the path for Keir Starmer to come into Downing Street. Um, 
SNP MPs choosing their words very carefully. But the majority of senior ones are backing uh, um, John Swinney tonight. They think he is the best person for the job. OK, David Porter, thank you very much. Well, that is it from Holyrood for the moment, but sport stops for no one, not even the First Minister. For now, I'll hand you back to the Reporting Scotland studio and Amy Irons. Thanks very much, Laura. Yes, sport, it never stops. And it is that time of the year when awards are about to be dished out. And today we've found out that these four players are up for Premiership Player of the Year. Rangers duo Jack Butland and James Tavenier, along with Celtics Matt O'Reilly and Hearts Captain Lauren Shankland, have been nominated for the PFA Scotland Prize by their fellow players. Let's all hear from them now. Ball swung in. O'Hara's header. And in Butland's. Well, it's been... Um... An enjoyable year, um, and uh, yeah, it means that you've done something right or performed well. So it's it's a nice feeling to have, and um, yeah, a bit of tough competition, but it's uh, it's enjoyable. We've put ourselves in a position to to achieve some great things, um, but that is all we've done. We've put ourselves in a position to do so, and we all know what it's going to take and what we have to do to to get over the line and get what we need. Decent ball in for Matt O'Reilly. It's been really fun. Um, I've learned a lot, to be honest, just because, I don't know, when, you, when you're doing well, naturally there's more noise around you as well, so I've had to manage things on and off the pitch more, and I think that's made me grow quite a lot as a person. There's a lot of trust in, in everybody. We've, we've got people like James, Cal and, and Joe who have obviously been around the block numerous times, and they know what is required in these moments. And Of course, we've got a manager who's been here as well this time. So I think, put all those together, you're in a quite a good place. Shacklin! I mean, one of the mainstays in the team. Uh, Hearts obviously helps it. You're playing every week and you get that recognition at a big club. And as I've done, just concentrate on my football and try to keep my form going for last season as well. Goals has just been in, been in the right position, and I've always kind of had that knack for being younger. Um, goal scoring's always been a good part of my game, but it was kind of other parts, as you say, people are looking for me to go and improve. But I've just looked to add that. I've played a slightly different roles for Hearts at times as well, position wise. And, probably just added to my game all round and it's just all came together. Tavernier! I always try to improve my whole game. I'm, I'd say I'm never perfect in any area. You can always work hard on every single aspect of your game. So that's it, just all the finer details and you know working hard and it obviously helps scoring um, a lot of goals and getting a lot of assists. We've really, you know, went leaps and bounds from from where we were to where we are now and the way we've improved as a team and as a club. So, yeah, we can't think too far ahead. Um, like I said, it's the most important thing is this weekend and we've obviously got to concentrate on that and, and try and win. And we will hear from the women's nominees tomorrow. Speaking of the women's game, in Hearts booked a spot in their first ever Scottish Cup final with a 3-0 win over Spartans yesterday. But Rangers still have hopes of a treble this season after a 2-0 win over Celtic in the semi-final on Saturday. Late goals from Chelsea Cornet and Kirsty Howitt helped Rangers to the win over their city rivals at Hampden in what was their fifth meeting this season. Meanwhile, for Hearts, strikes from Kate Mooney, Kathleen McGovern and Carly Girasoli made history for the club, who hope to find the same form against Rangers in the final on the 26th of May that they managed to find in their league win over the side last week. Dundee United striker Tony Watt believes they should be targeting the top six of the Premiership next season after winning promotion from the Championship. United secured the title with a goalless draw against Airdrionians on Friday night. And speaking to the Scottish Football Podcast, Watt says they need to aim high. Since I joined till now, the building's totally different. Everything's, everything's changed. A lot of things are in place. There's more structure in place. I think we even announced that head of recruitment the other day and I think the manager's obviously straight to the point. There's no no ifs or buts with him. So I think he'd be the, he'll be the right guy to lead us and if we can replicate this year's form in a harder league then I'm sure we can go and push for that top six spot or just get up and give the fans something to cheer about. Rugby now and Franco Smith's Glasgow Warriors side continued their fine form in the United Rugby Championship while Edinburgh kept their playoff hopes alive. 
Despite going behind early on, Warriors secured a bonus point win over Zebre in Italy with Kyle Steen stealing the show with his two tries. Elsewhere, Edinburgh produced a dominant display to ease past Cardiff at the Arms Park. Well, the results mean that Warriors now sit top of the URC. Look at that with Leinster. Just four points clear, sorry, of Leinster, with three rounds still to play. If they can stay there, they will face the side which finishes eighth in the table in the playoff quarterfinals. And that could very well be Edinburgh, as you see there. Although they still do have work to do, they are a point off the playoffs currently in ninth place at the moment. And that is all your sport. Now it's back to Laura at Holyrood. Thank you, Amy. Uh, well, yes, welcome back to Holyrood. Our political correspondent, Lindsay Bues, joins us now for a bit more analysis. Um, Lindsay, it has been quite a momentous few days. How would you sum up that and today especially? Yeah, it's been an extraordinary few days, hasn't it, Laura? Because just last week we were at Butte House for Hamza Youssef's big announcement on the end of that power sharing deal with the Greens. He hailed that as a new beginning. Just a few days later, we were back there in the same room and it was the end for Hamza Youssef. How quickly it all unravelled for him after that political misstep in his handling of the end of that power sharing deal. But when you take a step back and you look at the big picture, many of the problems problems that he was facing are going to be faced by whoever takes over. Problems that were inherited from Nicola Sturgeon when she brought her career as First Minister to an end. So the new leader is going to have to grapple with things like a strategy on how to pursue independence. Where will the party go next when it comes to that? Internal, internal divisions within the party on issues like independence, but also on gender policy. And they will have to work with other parties too. Hamza Youssef did that in a formal agreement. This new leader will be doing it in a minority government in an informal basis, but they will still have to find common ground in Hollywood, whoever takes over is going to have to set out their vision pretty quickly, get back on the front foot with their agenda, with a general election looming later this year. Yeah, indeed, uh, lots of challenges, lots of questions, but thank you very much, Lindsay Views, for your thoughts tonight. Well, in his resignation speech today, Hamza Yusuf said, as a young boy born and raised in Scotland, he could never have dreamt that one day he would have the privilege of leading his country. He said, people who looked like me were not in positions of political influence, let alone leading governments when I was younger. Gillian Sharp has more. As a young boy, born in, at times, an emotional speech, Hamza Yusuf made reference to his background and the position he's held for just over a year. People who looked like me were not in positions of political influence, let alone leading governments, when I was younger. But we now live in a UK that has a British Hindu Prime Minister, a Muslim Mayor of London, a Black Welsh First Minister, and for a little while longer, a Scots Asian First Minister of this country. For some, his election was groundbreaking. I joined the party about four or five years ago, is when I saw Hamza. Uh, being able to be a cabinet minister uh, and be someone of a similar background to, to myself. And I thought, if he can do it, then uh, there's hope for the rest of us. Last year, on his first night in his official residence, Hamza Youssef posted his family at prayer. And then there was Gaza, where Hamza Youssef's relatives were caught up in the conflict, and he was early to call for a ceasefire. For some, like these students, that was significant. I think that um, Muslims and, and uh, minority ethnic background people, I think they really did resonate with that and they did appreciate it. I think it was incredibly important for representation. I think it was incredibly important that Muslims felt that they were represented in Scottish government. Amr Anwar has known Hamza Youssef for many years as a lawyer and friend. Although during his time as a minister and first minister, there were tensions. I remember being at Parliament House when he was sworn in by the Lord Justice General. And I, for me, it came to me that in that room at that time, the only people of colour really was his family, myself and Hamza Yusuf. It was a historic day to see that happen. But I did say at the time, there could be no honeymoon period. And so it's proved for Scotland's first Muslim First Minister, just 13 months after he was elected. Gillian Sharp, Reporting Scotland. Well, I'm joined now by a couple of journalists who have been watching 
all of this drama unfold, Keenan Andrews, uh, the Scottish political editor from The Times, and Louise Wilson, political editor from Holyrood magazine. Thank you both for coming down to Windy Holyrood tonight. Um, coming to you first, Keenan, you were one of the first people who got wind of this uh, resignation. Um, did Hamza Yusuf have any other option in the end? In the end, not really. He was faced with and being unable to get a vote passed, uh, to, to survive a vote of no confidence in him in the Scottish Parliament without doing a deal with uh, Alex Salmond's ALPA party. In the end, he decided, his closest advisers decided um, with him that was unpalatable and that, that was the end for Hamza Youssef. They, they made that decision after a long meeting on Sunday afternoon at Butte House where he made his resignation statement today and decided the game was up. Louise, let's talk about some of the names that are in the frame. Interestingly, it seems to come down to two people that are coming um, to the front, forefront today. Um, John Swinney, former First Minister, and Kate Forbes, former leadership candidate. Um, who's your money on? Uh, I would likely say John Swinney. Um, he's received the backing of numerous cabinet secretaries already, um, and he is very much seen as a safe pair of hands for the SNP. Um, that said, we can't discount a challenger from Kate Forbes. She obviously stood last year. She gained some support, although uh, had a bit of a problem with some of her uh, more socially conservative views. Um, but that said, maybe if the SNP wants to decide want to go for a fresh face, it will be her over a continuity candidate like Swinney. Um, yeah, Kieran, what, what are your thoughts on that? Because as Louise was saying, in some ways, um, so Yusuf, um, he was the cont continuity candidate and it, it hasn't worked. So do you think that they, they would go a different direction, somebody like Kate Forbes? Well, there's definitely a move on to try and uh, stitch this up almost to advance that John Swinney is the only candidate. The SNP knows, you know, the SNP hierarchy knows that during last year's leadership contest, which was a really bitter and bruising one between comes Yusuf, Kate Forbes and Ash Reagan. The, the party went down in the polls, so they're tr going to try and avoid that. That's why John Swinney is out on the front foot, all these big endorsements. The flip side is that people around Kate Forbes think that, you know, John Swinney is the continuity candidate's continuity candidate. And that, um, you know, going kind of back to the future, John Swinney was leader of the SNP before, isn't what the SNP needs to drag itself out of the decline that it's currently suffering. And Louise, I mean, I asked this of, of um, our, our editor, uh, Scotland's editor, James Cook, but, um, you know, in some ways it doesn't matter because it's a new face, but the same challenges, there's still huge challenges ahead for the party. Yes, of course. And a lot of the problems that Hamza Yousaf face are the same challenges that Nicola Sturgeon before him faced. So, you know, whatever the change of leaders is going to be, there's going to be still a lot of things happening. There's still Operation Branch Form, of course, ongoing. Um, so whoever takes that mantle is not in for an easy ride. Um, Kieran, uh, how damaging in sort of a wider context do you think this has been, this period especially for the SNP, and has it um, damaged the party in, in voters' eyes? Well, you can see that from uh, all of the polling evidence. The SNP is on the steady slide down in terms of public support, at the same time as you know support for independence remains high, which shows that it, it's the SNP, the party, the brand, which is losing the trust of certainly some voters, including a chunk of independence voters. Um, and, and that's what they need to win back if they are to, to reverse this, not face a really difficult night at the general election, but also looking ahead to a couple of years' time, stay in power at Holyrood in 2026, because right now, that's not a given either. And Louise, just really briefly, um, how important is it for the SNP to get on the front foot? Just a couple of sentences. I mean, really, really important. As Kieran says, there's a general election coming up this year. They want to be going that, showing a united front, because that is, after all, what voters care about. OK, listen, we will have to leave it there. It is fascinating stuff, and I'm sure we will be speaking to you again. But thank you very much, Kieran Andrews and uh, Louise Wilson, for your time this evening. Well, I can tell you it has been a very chilly day in Holyrood. Here is Christopher with the rest of the weather. Good evening. We've certainly had some rather cloudy and wet weather across the country today with outbreaks of rain working their way northwards. This is uh, the culprit, an area of low pressure, and you can see the radar on the chart there so you can see the progress of the rain uh, through the course of today. And it's still with us into this evening and for the first part of the night, but generally tending to peter out so with some clear skies developing through central and eastern Scotland. The wind's easing down as well. They have been blustery at times today. Not as chilly as recent nights. Temperatures there in towns and cities 
5 to 8 Celsius. To tomorrow, and we start the day with some sunshine in the north and the east, but then the cloud building from the south without breaks of rain pushing their way up the western side of the country across the Hebrides. And uh, we'll start to see some brighter skies developing in the east. So by mid-afternoon, it's an east-west split. Some lovely sunshine for the likes of Edinburgh, Dundee and Aberdeen. But you can see behind me, cloudier conditions with some outbreaks of rain. It's generally mild for all, 15, 16 degrees, and winds largely light inland. A little more of a breeze around the North Sea coast in towards the Northern Isles, so a cooler feel here. As we head in towards tomorrow evening, we start to see that rain disappearing, but we then start to develop an east wind, and that will bring some rather mild air. The mild air mass coming over cold seas will lead to some mist and murk, some heart around eastern coast. So whilst Tuesday is bright and sunny in the east, from Wednesday onwards, we change that, and it's the west that will have the best of the sunshine. The east will have cloud with some low cloud and some rain at times. And in the sunshine in the west, we're looking at around 18 or 19 Celsius. Contrast that with the east, much cooler, much greyer. And a similar sort of picture, really, as we head through towards Thursday. Once again, in the west, 19, maybe 20 degrees. In the east, it will be cooler, cloudy with a few showers. And a similar sort of east-west split in terms of temperature, at least, on Friday. 20 degrees in the west, cooler in the east, cloud elsewhere with one or two showers at times. That's the forecast for now. And that brings to an end this specially extended edition of Reporting Scotland Live from the Scottish Parliament on the day Hamza Youssef resigned as First Minister. And as one chapter in Scottish politics ends, another begins. Who will write it? Well, that's another question. Just before you go, I'll leave you with some of the images of a tumultuous few days. Live from Edinburgh, good night. The Scottish Government is to ditch a key climate change target. The Government said it was no longer committing to reducing Scotland's emissions by 75% by 2030. First Minister, are you worried about the Butte House Agreement? No, 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 not at all. Like, I really value the Butte House Agreement. I've seen very many criticisms of the Cass report. Do you agree with it? Things like think the evidence that wasn't considered by it. The First Minister has called an emergency cabinet meeting this morning amid speculation about the future of the power sharing deal with the Scottish Greens. Is the coalition over? I have formally notified Patrick Harvey and Lorna Slater that I am terminating the Butte House Agreement. Relations had strained over watered down climate targets and the response to a review of gender identity services for children. This is a total U turn. The future generations of Scotland have been betrayed. The people of Scotland didn't vote for this mess and this chaos. Yeah. Isn't Hamza Youssef a lame duck first minister? Our record is one that we can stand on and one that we can be proud of. Hamza Youssef is to face a vote of no confidence. We will support a vote of no confidence in the first minister. Can you survive a confidence vote? That may depend on his former SNP leadership rival, Ash Regan, who could hold the casting vote. She is now a member of Alex Salmond's Alaba party. Hamza Youssef himself is now under severe pressure after barely a year in office. He is ruling out any deal with Alex Salmond's Alaba party. The BBC understands that Hamza Youssef is considering resigning. Repairing our relationship across the political divide can only be done with someone else at the helm. I have therefore informed the SNP's National Secretary of my intention to stand down as party leader and ask that she commence as a leadership contest for my replacement as soon as possible.